previous Introduction to Nanograv video, we talked about how Nanograv is trying to detect gravitational waves by using pulsars. But just what are pulsars? Well, it turns out that they're actually one of the strangest objects that we know about in the universe and have some of the most extreme physical characteristics. And there's really a lot that we still don't fully understand about them. Put very briefly, a pulsar is the core of a star that has collapsed into a neutron star, but it also has some additional properties that are very important. First, these pulsars spin very rapidly. They also have very strong magnetic fields, and these magnetic fields actually produce a powerful uh, thin beam of radio waves that shoot into space. And we can actually sometimes see this radiation beam as a repeating pulse pattern. So we'll see this blinking pattern in the sky. So again, these are very strange objects. And what we're gonna do is take a little bit closer look at some of the properties of, of these pulsars. So let's go into a little bit more detail about how these pulsars actually are formed. And to begin, let's just start with a star. So these are the outer layers of the star and the star also has a core as well. Now, inside the core of this star, there's actually a powerful fusion reaction taking place. And that fusion reaction produces heat and pressure that supports the star against gravitational collapse. The force of gravity acting on the outer layers of this star is always trying to pull the star inwards. But this fusion reaction stops the star from actually collapsing. Now, near the end of the star's life, this core runs out of fuel for its fusion reaction. So this fusion reaction is suddenly going to stop. And when this occurs, the star goes supernova. The core of the star can no longer support itself against gravity and very rapidly collapses down to a very small size. And when this happens, a huge amount of energy is given off. So much energy that the outer layers of the star are actually violently thrown into space. So this gigantic explosion is what we refer to as a supernova. Now, if the star that went supernova is has the correct mass range, about 8 to 20 times the mass of the sun, then when this core collapses, it will actually collapse into a neutron star. So what we're left over with is the neutron star. Now, if the original star had a mass of less than eight times the mass of the sun, for instance, our own sun, then this full compression won't really take place and the core of the star will actually just collapse into a white dwarf star. On the other hand, if the star is very massive, more than 20 times the mass of the sun, the core of that star will have enough mass to further collapse all the way down into a black hole. But when the mass of the star is in the right range, 8 to 20 times the mass of the sun, then it will form a neutron star when it goes supernova. So over here we have a picture of the Crab Nebula. And this is actually the supernova remnant of a star that exploded. And for this particular one, the explosion that pushed off the outer layers of this star was actually observed by early astronomers in the Middle East, China, and Japan in the year 1054. They saw a new star appear in the sky and fade over a couple of weeks. And that uh, star was actually this supernova event. And in the very center of this supernova, too small for us to see visually, we've actually detected the radio waves of one of these pulsars. So we actually know that there is a neutron star at the center of this supernova remnant. Now these neutron stars that are left over from the core collapse are about one and a half to three times the mass of the sun. So the rest of the original mass of the sun of the star was blown off in the supernova explosion. But these cores have one and a half to three times the mass of the sun. But these objects are only about 25 kilometers in diameter. So they're only about the size of a city. That means that these objects are incredibly dense. There's a huge amount of mass in a relatively small space. If you could compress the entire mass of Mount Everest into a small backpack, you would be close to the density of one of these neutron stars. Really, the only other place 
in nature that we find densities like this are in the cores of atomic nuclei. So the entire neutron star kind of acts like a giant atomic nucleus. And inside the cores of these neutron stars, we still don't even know what form matter takes at such immense densities and pressures. These objects are so small and massive that their surface gravity is about 200 billion times stronger than the surface gravity on Earth. So on this neutron star, you would feel 200 billion times heavier than you do on the Earth. So again, these neutron stars have some very extreme physical characteristics to them. Now, when this star collapses into a, into a neutron star, there are two very important things that happen. So our star collapses into a neutron star. The first thing that happens is that these neutron stars will start to spin very, very rapidly. And this is due to conservation of angular momentum. It's the same thing that actually happens to you if you spin around on the spot with your arms held outwards and then quickly pull your arms in. As you pull your arms in, as you pull your arms towards yourself, you'll feel yourself start to spin faster. So this star that we, this star that we start out with originally has some spin to it. For instance, our sun spins once every 25 days. So every 25 days, we'll get one spin for our sun. So this star is spinning, and when it collapses, when all this mass gets pulled in, just like when you pull your arms in, you'll spin faster, this neutron star will also spin faster. Now, most neutron stars spin once every second. So every one second, we'll get one spin. But there's actually a class of millisecond pulsars that can rotate hundreds of times per second. So they'll spin every, you know, say uh, 10 milliseconds, they'll go through one spin. Some of these millisecond pulsars will actually spin as fast as a blender. So we can get very, very high spins on some of these neutron stars. The second thing that happens during the collapse is that the magnetic fields that the star has, so our original star will have, you know, some magnetic fields, but these magnetic fields will be compressed along with the star, resulting in some extremely, extremely powerful magnetic fields as we have shown in this diagram. Now, these magnetic, ro magnetic fields rotate along with the star, and as they do that, they'll actually produce a very powerful beam of radio waves that shoot out of the north and south magnetic poles of the star. Now, in general, the direction of this radio beam is not along the same axis that the pulsar is spinning on. So as this pulsar rotates, this beam of radiation will point in different directions in the sky. And I actually have a video of this. Okay, so this video shows how this radio beam will sweep across the sky as the pulsar rotates, very much like a lighthouse. So we start it going. Now, if this radio beam isn't pointing directly towards the Earth, we really don't see very much, since neutron stars don't shine like other stars. But if the neutron star is oriented in the right way and the Earth is in the right position, every time the neutron star rotates, we're going to see a little burst of radio waves for a short time. So every time this uh, object spins around, we're going to see a blip, blip, blip pattern. And we can detect and measure this signal by using radio telescopes. And we'll talk a little bit more about the kinds of telescopes we use in future videos. At this time, we've discovered about 2,000 different pulsars within the Milky Way galaxy. And we expect that there are many more out there. We're still actively searching for new pulsars. And each one of these pulsars has a unique spin rate and radio pulse profile. So these radio pulse profiles correspond to the intensity of the radio waves that are being uh, that are arriving at our telescope every time the pulsar rotates. So this big spike corresponds to when the radio beam is pointed directly towards us. And we can actually listen to these pulse profiles just by taking the output of our radio telescope and hooking it up to a speaker. And I have a couple examples of this. So these uh, pulse profiles and sound files 
all come from the Jodrell Bank Observatory in England. And the first pulsar we're going to listen to is B0329. Now, these pulsar names basically correspond to their location in the sky. It's the right ascension and declination, but it's not that important. So this first pulsar rotates at 1.4 rotations per second. So this is what we hear. So that repeating blip pattern is really what is happening every time this pulsar rotates. Every time it points towards the Earth, we see this little burst of radio waves. And this one rotates 1.4 times per second. So the next pulsar that we're going to look at is the crab pulsar. And this pulsar rotates 30 times per second. So here's what we hear. So if you imagine this as corresponding to this pulsar spinning, you get a sense of how fast this object would actually have to be spinning. And this really is what we, what we get when we point a radio telescope at the Crab Nebula. We, we hear this very, very fast repeating pattern associated with it. So that's a, a medium speed pulsar. Now let's look at one of the true millisecond pulsars. So this pulsar rotates 174 times per second. It rotates so fast that we're not going to be able to hear the individual pulses. We hear it as a single tone, and here it is. So this pulsar is spinning as fast as a blender. It's every time we get one of those pulses corresponds to it rotating around once. So it's just rotating at a, a truly unimaginable speed. So we see these different pulsars, and each one of these pulsars is unique in its pulse profile and its rotation rate. Now, it turns out that these pulsar signals can be exceedingly stable and regular, most notably for the fastest rotating millisecond pulsars. And for some of our best pulsars, we can predict when an individual pulse is going to occur years ahead of time to within an accuracy of 100 nanoseconds, or 1 10 millionth of a second. This incredible timing accuracy can sometimes rival that of atomic clocks on Earth, especially over long time scales. And it's this property that allows us to use the pulsar signal basically as a kind of celestial clock, and each one of these pulses is one of the ticks of that clock. And in the next video, we'll see how we can use this property of it being a very accurate clock to help us detect gravitational waves.